decided to do my PhD thesis on exorcism in Islam. Seeking knowledge and obligation made easy. Thought about studying for a long time? Tuition fees keeping you from actually starting? Islamic Online University has led a revolution in online learning. The world's first tuition-free degree, BA in Islamic Studies. Access the knowledge, any place, anytime, anywhere. It just doesn't get any easier than that. Classes, texts, assignments, completely online. Set your own schedule for the semester. No overseas travel required for the exams. Subjects taught by qualified English-speaking scholars. Weekly live sessions in virtual classrooms. With curricula based on those in El Medina University in Saudi Arabia, El Azhar University in Cairo, and other reputable institutions around the world. Why wait any longer? You pay just a symbolic registration fee and are ready to begin the adventure of higher education. The most diverse student body of any university in the world. 130,000 plus registered students from 217 countries. Log in to the website for more details. www.islamiconlineuniversity.com Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salam ala rasooli al-kareem Wa ala ahli wa sahabi Wa man istanna bi sunnatihi ila yawm al-deen All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day the topic, the world of the jinn, is the one which tends to bring out the most people. <laughs> which is why we chose it. Had we chose some other fiqh topic or something like this, I'm sure we wouldn't see a quarter of the number of people who are here this evening. This is a very interesting topic because it is an, a topic that most of us don't really know too much about. We have uh, grown up in different societies where there are many stories, fables, uh, old wives' tales, all kinds of uh, information or misinformation about the jinn. And as a result, most of us have a very garbled understanding of this world. In fact, uh, myself, uh, when I was looking around for a topic to do my PhD thesis on, I stumbled onto this topic for the same reason, that in spite of having studied on the BA level, in Medina University, on a master's level, King Saud University in Riyadh, all in Arabic, studying the sources, etc. Still, the world of the jinn remained something unclear. I had heard, of course, other information, maybe that the average person doesn't hear from scholarly circles, but even in the scholarly circles, so-called scholarly circles, there was a lot of, you know, questionable material circulating. So I decided to do my PhD thesis on exorcism in Islam, the exorcist tradition in Islam, to get clarity on this area on one hand, to get clarity, and at the same time, to provide in the, uh, we call them the Orientalist circles, where people are studying in uh, universities, 
doing oriental studies, meaning studies of the, the East and the religions and cultures of the East. There, the image or the understanding of Muslim belief concerning the invisible world around us is also very garbled because the researchers, Western researchers, who have studied or who have researched the area of Muslim beliefs in the spirit world, they went to the various Muslim cultures around the world from, from India to South Africa to Indonesia to, you know, Maldives, all around the world, wherever there are Muslims, and they questioned them about their beliefs. And of course, they got all of the confusion and the misunderstanding that most Muslims have about this world. And they wrote it up as uh, scientific research into the culture of Muslims. And that's what's available in their circle. So I felt it was also important to leave behind a document, my thesis, which would give a clear picture of the unseen world and the forces there, especially concerning the world of the jinn and how it interacts with our world. So I undertook this research traveling to different parts of the Muslim world, meeting with people who were dealing with the unseen world, the, the, the exorcists, those who were themselves practicing exorcists and focusing particularly on those who claim to be treating these situations of, of possession, etc., in accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah. I restricted myself to those who claimed they were treating in accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah. Because there are so many other people who are involved in other practices. They don't bother to claim Quran and Sunnah. They're just doing their own thing. You know that there was no point into, in researching into those areas because I felt there would be, there's enough confusion out there already. We don't need to hear more. But I felt it was necessary to go to research this to get the clarity, the clarity of uh, this world for the benefit of Muslims, for myself first and foremost, for the benefit of Muslims in general, and even for non-Muslims, you know, who have this uh, mistaken understanding as to what our beliefs consist of. So, when looking into the world of the jinn, and some people say, well, you know, why even bother going to this area, <laughs> you know? I know, why don't we not just leave it? You know, there's so many other things to occupy our, our, ourselves with. You know, we have, um, you know, Muslims being killed in Syria, etc., you know, and problems in Egypt, and etc. Why even bother to go into the world of the jinn? Well, reality is that on one hand, the Muslim community is continually uh, embroiled in this world. Not just the Muslim actually, but the world community. But the Muslim community issues are arising all the time. I can say that I don't think I have been to a single country in the world. And I've been to many, maybe 60, 70 different countries. We're visiting Muslim communities. I wasn't going to them for sightseeing, etc. I went to India maybe about 15 times and I never went to Taj Mahal. Okay? So it's not about sightseeing. But, you know, meeting Muslims from all over the world, I must say that everywhere I went, people came with problems and issues concerning 
the world of the jinn. So, as much as Syria and Egypt are important, though we can't do very much about it where we are, in the situation that we're in, at least in the case of the world of the jinn, for us to get clarity in this area and be able to enlighten others who uh, may have fallen into different forms of heresy or misguidance because of their interaction with this world. At least there is something direct that we can take away, uh, inshallah, this evening from this topic. The world of the jinn is important enough that we have in the Quran, in the 72nd chapter, we have a surah named the chapter of the jinn. If it weren't something that important, something that we needed to know about, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have taken the time to put in the final book of Revelation sections, important sections, which deal with the world of the jinn. So that alone is enough to tell us it is important. It is an area of knowledge that we should have, when we should have clarity on it. And this is mainly because the world of the jinn is not like the world of the unseen in the rest of the universe. When the universe began, what is going on on various planets, you know, millions and billions of light years away. This is all part of the world of the unseen. And the Western world, that is their concern. They want to know, how did this world begin? The Big Bang and everything about it. And what's going on on these other stars, you know? Other planets that they can see seem to be out there uh, moving around stars, billions of light years away, etc. That's their concern. But reality is that that world has no relevance to this. It in no way affects this world. We can live our whole life not knowing anything of that or knowing all that they know and it doesn't make any difference. It is only important for them because they don't believe that there was a God, there is a God, and that everything happened by accident, so they want to try to understand that accident. So that is their concern. But this is not our concern. We believe in God. We believe there was and is and always will be a God. This world was already created. The stars, Allah describes them as beautifying the sky. This is why he put them there. To beautify the sky for us. Not for us to try to get there and take anything back. No. But it was part of the beautification as he beautified the earth, he beautified the heavens. But the world of the jinn, which collides with our world at different points in time, through different individuals, this has direct relevance to our world. You only have to open the newspaper, most newspapers, and you find the horoscope column. And the whole world of the horoscopes 
which is the world of fortune telling, is connected to the jinn. That's in our daily newspapers. Every single day you open the newspaper, there you'll find us interacting with the world of the jinn. Now the term jinn comes from the verb janna, right? Janna, which means to cover or to hide or to conceal. And it refers to creatures who Allah created besides human beings who also have a free will but who dwell in a world which is for the most part invisible to us. They represent a parallel world to our world. Now how that parallel world exists next to ours um, some people when they hear that and they think well okay what does that mean there are, there are jinns in the room here with us right now and are they looking at us all the time and some sisters say A'udhu Billah we have to cover ourselves the jinns are in the bathrooms they are everywhere and how that parallel world exists with ours is not uh, a part of our knowledge. It is not possible to know about it. Neither do the jinn know, nor do we know. Whatever we know is what has been revealed to us by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not from the speculation of those who speculate, and there are books written under the title Conversations with a Jinn where people who are involved in exorcism claim to have communicated with the Jinn and the Jinn told them about their world and this and that and you know, it's a whole long story about that. Don't believe it. As the Prophet ﷺ had said, Describing the jinn. وَهُوَ كَذُوبُ They are incessant liars. So even if you make the contact, be sure that whatever information is coming to you, it is a hundred lies, maybe one truth, mixed with a hundred lies. So it is not a world to be trusted. And the people will tell us stories about their aunt who had a jinn who used to come and clean their house, you know, regularly every Friday. Or another one whose uncle was taught the Quran by a jinn. Or Sheikh so and so who used to have jinns attending his class because when they would sit there quietly in the class, they could hear pens on paper in the background, in the dark corners of the classroom. Don't believe that stuff. What you focus on is what is clearly confirmed in the Quran and the Sunnah. This we know is with certainty, this is the truth. Everything other than that is speculation and likely untruth. The jinn the world of those creatures also referred to as Jan, the plural form of Jinn. That world was created before our world. Which is the reason why the angels questioned Allah concerning the creation of human beings. 
because they shared with the world of the jinn the ability to choose between good and evil and the world of the jinn already being on earth before human beings with that same choice chose to spread mischief to spill blood and to corrupt the earth so they question Allah are you going to make another one who will corrupt the earth like those that came before some people when they see that verse they wonder how did the angels know that what human beings were going to do they knew the future no they knew what the jinn had already done on earth so the it was for them to conclude that human beings having the same abilities the ability to choose between right and wrong would do the same thing in terms of the logical question how do we know that the jinn were created before human beings is that an opinion no it's not an opinion in surah al-kahf which we read every friday in the 50th ayah allah says there wal janna khalaqna min qabl min nar as-samum and i created the jinn before that from a fiery wind before what before creating human beings because the beginning of the verse it starts off indeed i created man or humankind from dried clay from black pet putrid mud and the jinn before that from a fiery wind so this is the evidence the quranic evidence that the jinn were created before humankind and basically the jinn in terms of their modes of existence are of three types the prophet saw alayhi wasallam said there are three types of jinn one type which flies in the air all the time another type which exists as snakes and dogs and an earthbound type which resides in one place or wanders about these are the three forms in which the jinn exist in the world with regards to their faith they are divided into two categories believers and disbelievers just like human beings and you will find among them those who followed jesus alayhi salam and those who followed paul or similar ideas of corruption and before that david moses etc of the prophets may allah's peace and blessings be upon them we know prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has informed us that as every human being is created with an angel who encourages us to good a guardian angel he informed us who encourages us to good this may be related to our conscience when we are thinking to do something bad or the thought comes to us and then something in our head says no better you don't do that Allah knows best that could be the presence that is the direct impact of the guardian angel that is with each and every human being at the same time that guardian angel is in a struggle with an evil force that is with each and every individual which encourages us 
to evil. We might be thinking, sitting, reflecting on good things, normal things, and then all of a sudden, a bad idea seems to pop into our head. Ooh, where did that come from? A'udhu Billah. Allah knows best, but that could be the presence, the evidence of that evil prompting. Of course, our own soul is described in three states. An-Nafs al-Lawama, An-Nafs al-Mutma'inna, and An-Nafs al-Ammara bisu. Some people understand it as three different uh, souls, types of souls. But the evidence supports the fact that these were in fact three different stages that every human being goes through. There are times when our soul commands us to good, encourages us to do good. And chides us from doing wrong. This is the, the stage known as an nafs al lawama. And there are times when the soul is bent on evil. We have encouragements external all around us, but we are set to do this thing. And we are urged on from within ourselves. This is the nafs al-ammara bisu. That is the state when our heart is sunk to its lowest of levels. And the state when we are good, we feel good, we want to do good, we encourage good. And in that state, we are Peaceful souls, we are souls which are contented. And that is the state known as Al-Nafs Al-Mutma'inna. Prophet Muhammad Wasallam told us in another narration, authentic narration, found in Sahih Muslim, every one of you has been assigned a companion from the jinn. A qareen. And the companions asked him, even you, O Messenger of Allah. And he said, even me. However, Allah has helped me against him and he has submitted. Allah has helped me against him and he has submitted. And now he only tells me to do good. Of course, if you hear Sheikh Fulan, Pierre Fulan making this claim, no, he's off. This is special for the prophets of Allah. This is not for any other human being to claim, my Qareen has submitted and only commands me to do good. Like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because you do have a lot of people out there claiming to work with the jinn. I'm sure most of you, you know in your area, there's somebody, if you lose anything, you go to him, he tells you, okay, this is where you can find it. He's there telling people where they can find things. And for sure, if he's not the one stealing them, he's working with the jinn. In terms of control of the jinn, because this is what the, these people claim, we have control over the jinn. They have submitted to us. They do whatever we tell them to do. Know that this is a lie. Because even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was unable to control the jinn. Because surely, if he were given that power, then the battle of Badr, the, you know, the Muslims losing lives in Uhud and all these different struggles that he had to go through. He had this army of the jinn, they're working for him, finish. 
Who could defeat him? But it didn't happen. It didn't happen. And in our various communities where people are claiming to have this contact with the jinn and protection from the jinn and this and that and I know people tell me, you know, so and so he said, you can take a knife and stick it in him and it, he's there, it doesn't affect him. Believe that if Muslims had that control and power, we would not have been defeated by the colonialists. Right? We wouldn't. Because these stories are found all over the Muslim world. Potions and amulets and things which they give. Muslim fighters were going into battle wearing these things, believing that these things made them, you know, impervious to, to bullets. Bullets would bounce off. But instead they died in thousands. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he had related to the Sahaba on one occasion, which is our clear evidence that nobody has control over the jinn. Clear evidence. Even Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He related to the Sahaba in a hadith found in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Indeed, he said, an ifrit from among the jinn spat on me last night, trying to break my salah. However, Allah let me overpower him, and I wanted to tie him to the columns of the masjid, so that you all would see him in the morning. Then I remembered my brother Suleiman's prayer. O oh my Lord, forgive me and bestow on me a kingdom not allowed to anyone after me. Allah Rabbi Khfirli wa habli mulkan la yambaghi li ahadim min ba'di. This was the dua of Prophet Sulaiman. Allah gave him as his miracle control over the jinn. The world of the jinn. Or certain jinn from that world. And he asked Allah that it be unique to him. And Allah answered his prayer. And that is confirmed by what Rasulullah told us as narrated in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. Now, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> one of the most direct ways in which the world of the jinn collides with our world is in the area of fortune telling. Fortune telling being among the tools used by the world of the jinn, the evil from among that world, because we said there are believers and disbelievers. The evil from among that world, whose goal, whose goal, collective goal, is similar to that of Satan, which is basically to draw us into shirk and disbelief through one channel or another. Just as the evil amongst us the shayateen, the devils from amongst humankind. They don't feel happy until we are doing what they're doing. They try to draw us into their practices. Why? It is natural. It is a natural desire to want others to share in with you in whatever you have engaged yourself into. You feel more comfortable. What you're doing is wrong, but you feel more comfortable doing it when you have others doing wrong along with you. So, 
Similarly, the evil from among the jinn who interfere in our world, how they're able exactly, Allah knows best. Who decides which among them are able to cross over and who are not, Allah knows best. Their goal, as I said, is to draw us into shirk. And when they seek to pull somebody into shirk, like a fisherman, when he fishes, he does not throw the bare hook into the river or the sea. You know, he takes a nice shiny hook, he shines it up so it glitters, and he throws it into the sea, thinking that it will attract the fish. It doesn't. Not until he sticks a worm, or a cockroach, or something, on that hook, and then he throws it into the sea, the fish see food, and they bite the hook. So the method is to offer what appears to be good in order that you would bite the hook. Once they have you, then you become one of their tools. So fortune telling, because human beings are always worried about the future, isn't it? We always worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. We would like to know what is going to happen in the future. Because if we could find out what's going to happen in the future, then we could prepare for it from today. Naturally. The uh, weatherman, he tells you it's going to rain tomorrow. You take your umbrella with you when you go out in the morning. He's telling you something of the future, but it's a guess. Right? He's guessing because the satellite images have shown that in the neighboring country, it rained and the winds are blowing in your direction. So it's expected to rain here. Well, maybe it doesn't rain tomorrow, it rains the day after. But oftentimes, when they tell you it's going to rain, it does. So, are they fortune tellers? No. They're guessing. We call that educated guessing. It's based on knowledge. Whereas, the fortune tellers are now telling you about your future. And they will ask you information about your present and your past, what your name is, your mother's name, your father's name. Once you go to anybody and they start asking you this information, know that they are quacks. Right? He may have a name, Sheikh, so and so and so and so. But when he comes and you have a problem and he's asking, what is your name? What is your mother's name? And he's making calculations. No, he's a quack. Run as far away from him as you can. Or if he tells you where this gem and you have something called gemology. People claiming that you wear certain gems is going to bring out certain things and run as far away from these people as possible. The world of the jinn with regards to fortune telling remains an attractive world because you have some fortune tellers who give information which turns out to be accurate. 
they tell you such and such is going to happen and it happens. So, without that, of course, nobody would bother to go to fortune tellers. So, some of the things that they inform us of do take place. So, where do they get this knowledge from? Well, the Prophet ﷺ, he explained concerning the jinn that he spoke about, the first type that are aerial, that can leave our atmosphere into the higher reaches, outer reaches of the universe, are able to travel at speeds Allah knows best. And they connect up with other jinns who hover near the first heaven. And when Allah gives commands to the angels, and these commands are passed down through the heavens, they are able to hear bits and pieces of information. And they relay this information down. In the process of relaying that information, comets and meteorites, etc., catch some of them and destroy them. But some information works its way down till it reaches that witch, warlock, fortune teller, whatever. And they pass that information on. Accurate information. And Aisha asked about this to Rasulullah Should we go to these people for the accurate information? He said no. But she said, but sometimes they tell the truth. He said, it is one truth mixed with a hundred lies. One truth mixed with a hundred lies. That's the reality of the fortune tellers. What happens is that the fortune teller tells you one truth along with a hundred lies. Now, when you hear this information, of course, it's all the same. To you, it's all the same. You don't know which is the truth and which is the lie. Right? So you hear these bits of information. And you leave. Our nature is that what all we were told in that sitting goes into our subconscious. It sits in our head. When one of the things that he told you or she told you comes true, you say, ah, oh, the fortune teller told me the truth. Now all of the other things that they told you, which didn't happen, you forget them. The one that you heard which was the truth reinforces what was already in your head. And that's why you make that connection. You say, ah, told me the truth. So, in this way, the word spread. So and so told the truth. You know, he is telling the future. Accurately, he informed me and I told you and these things happen. So it is through this circle or this channel that information is passed on and we become convinced that in fact they are able to tell us the truth. But the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is that they're telling only one truth mixed with, as we said, as the Prophet ﷺ said, a hundred lies. And going to them to try to get that truth, of course you won't know which is the truth. Going to them, sincerely believing that they're going to tell you the truth, the Prophet ﷺ had said, that is disbelief in Islam. He said, whoever goes to a fortune teller, believing in what he is narrating, has disbelieved in what I brought, which was Islam. 
And even if we go to the fortune teller, out of curiosity, we're curious, you know, what's he going to say? We open up the horoscope. I don't really believe in the horoscope, but I'm curious to see what do they say. Okay, you people born in July, you cancers, don't do what you're planning to do today. It's not a good day for it. Now, if you go and you look at that, you read it out of curiosity, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, your prayers, your salawat, are not accepted for 40 days and nights. Now, I know some of you already opened up the newspaper and checked it out already today. So don't think that, oh, a'udhu billah, no point paying for the, praying for the next 40 days and nights then. <laughs> no. No, it doesn't work like that. Because when we pray, two things happen. One, we remove from ourselves the obligation of prayer. There's an obligation for us to pray five times a day. And when we pray correctly, we earn for ourselves a reward. We pray with consciousness, not thinking about what we were doing, what we were engaged in before the prayer. Our minds are everywhere else in the prayer. Flipping our scarves back and forth and up and down, etc., etc., in the prayer. Or checking our watches and checking our mobiles, making sure it's in our pockets. And, you know, we spend the prayer in all this kind of motion and activity. And we don't even know what we said in the prayer. That kind of prayer earns you zero, zero reward. But it does remove the obligation of prayer. Prophet Sallallahu said, do not pray the fard prayer twice. You did it. You did it badly. Don't do it again. Because had he not said that, then whenever you catch yourself, you try to do it again. And of course, shaitan will tell you, this was not quite right. You could do it another way. You try it again and again and again and again. And, you know, you'll go crazy. So to stop that from happening, the Prophet ﷺ said, don't pray the fard twice. Boom. So, though the reward for your prayers for the next 40 days and nights will not be given to you, they have been cancelled. If you looked at your horoscope today out of curiosity. Still, the obligation of prayer remains for the next 40 days and nights. The other area that our world collides with the world of the jinn is the area of magic. The area of magic. A lot of people think it's not real, magic, it's all fake. It's tricks. People have all kinds of contraptions, etc., that they use to make things appear as they really aren't. Well, there's a lot of that. But at the same time, in the midst of it all, there are some people involved in real magic. And those people who are involved in real magic are not people who have powers that we don't have, that other human beings don't have, because that's how they portray themselves, as having powers which make them idols for others. It's not that, but it is that they have made contact with the world of the jinn. And the jinn operate in collaboration with them. Remember we said they don't have control. There's no control. The jinn can operate in collaboration. 
they ask you to do certain acts of shirk and you want what appears to be the power you do it and they will do it for you so if you see someone who says he comes in the room you see that bottle of water and he holds his hand and the water bottle comes into his hand you have people who will do that who can do that and it, as it appears to you it's he has some kind of power where he can cause that bottle of water to get up off the table and come into his hand but the reality is that it is a simple act for the jinn you can't see the jinn he lifts up the bottle and puts it in the guy's hand so it only appears to you that he has this power because of the the invisible nature of the world of the jinn and this world has been from the very beginning in collision with our world which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about it in the Quran gave us information about this world because it was the last message the last revelation in the previous revelations this knowledge was given the prophets were given this knowledge and they passed it on to their people but the previous revelations became distorted knowledge of that world became distorted so people ended up with all kinds of confused ideas and even in our times even though yes we are following the last revelation the quran has been preserved the sunnah has been preserved so many people are so far away from the quran and sunnah they don't have correct access to knowledge about this world this is the reality this is the reality and that's why we are in this confused state as to the world of the jinn and this is why it is very important for the knowledge that i'm speaking of to be disseminated in our communities and to become common knowledge to pro- protect the community from this evil element this evil element coming from that world and we have the third major area after fortune telling and magic the area of demonic possession where the jinn may enter the body of a human being some people say no not spot not possible it's all made up it's not real it's fake not possible reality is that the evidence from the quran and the sunna indicate that it is a reality it is authentically narrated that a woman gave her child to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to treat him she said that he would be overcome by fits every day where he would lose control and he be shaking all this stuff he gave him to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the prophet opened the boy's mouth and he said o enemy of allah i am the messenger of allah get out Now, who is he talking to is a little boy he is obviously addressing an entity that had entered that boy so the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he exercised he treated people who were possessed and even in the corrupt scriptures of the christians there are references to jesus treating people who are possessed and in all of the earlier scriptures this exists so it is a reality also but 
what happens is that people not knowing the truth about this relationship use illegitimate means today to treat these situations. I should say that probably 85% of the cases of those people who tend to claim possession and the, the majority of those who claim that they have been possessed, <coughs> I would say 75% of them are women. 85% are psychological cases or medical cases they are not true possession at all and those who are really treating by Quran and Sunnah they will tell you that very few are real cases those who are not really treating by Quran and Sunnah they will tell you Everybody is possessed. Everybody. Like the psychiatrist. When you go to the psychiatrist, you know, everybody is sick. Everybody has some mental illness. Everybody must come to the psychiatrist. It's business. We're dealing with business here now. So, he will promote the idea that everybody is sick. As the exorcist will promote the idea everybody is possessed. But those who are truly dealing with this, according to Quran and Sunnah, they will tell you very few cases that it's real possession. But even in these cases, how do we treat people who are possessed? Most people go looking for somebody who says that he has a bigger jinn who will come and chase out the jinn from the person who is possessed. You go get another jinn to go and do the job for you. This is shirk. This is misguidance. This is what they want you to do. The other way is to confirm, to do acts which confirm shirk in the presence of the possessing jinn and he will leave himself. No problem. The job was done. You know, you see Christian exorcists taking people who are possessed. He raises the cross and he holds the Bible. Get out in the name of Jesus Christ and the person is cured. How? You go to India with the gurus who walk on hot coals. They bring people who are possessed to them. They pass incense over them and sprinkle water and call on the idol and the people get cured. So it's not surprising when some of the leading Christian uh, evangelists, they come to India. And I remember seeing somebody showed me a, a video of one in uh, would come to Delhi, I think. And he had like, you know, close to a million people there. And people were lining up to come at the end of the, his presentation, lining up to come for him to put his hand on them, right? And lo and behold, in the middle of the line were hijabis, and brothers wearing topis, waiting for their turn. So, this is what has happened. Because we don't understand. It's ignorance. We don't understand what is going on. The only legitimate way is to follow the way of Rasulullah and his companions as they were taught by him. We use Quranic recitation. We use the, the Sunnah du'as that the Prophet ﷺ has taught us. We recite them with understanding. And in this way, over periods of time, sometimes quickly, sometimes it takes a long time, etc. 
but people get cured and this is the only legitimate way. Now you have other people <clears throat> doing other things where if you come to the Sheikh, you come, you tell him you have this problem, he has a bottle here, it says take this water. You go and you sprinkle it over yourself, you drink it, whatever. What is this water? Special water. He is water that he has recited over. Right? So he gets, he has a room filled with bottles and he walks by them and he recites and goes. And they bottle it back and they close it up. And this is special holy water. Believe that this is not from the Sunnah. Though people are doing it. And maybe some reputable sheikhs are doing it. Because it has become commonplace. But it's not from the Sunnah. Rasulullah didn't do it. The Sahaba didn't do it. Some say, well, you know, when we're doing the uh, quls before we go to sleep, after we recite them, we blow on them, you know, doing what is called tafal. You see? So, when we do that, there must be some moisture in the blowing that we do, which goes on the hand. So that's what we're wiping on our bodies. So in that moisture, when the sheikh, he blows over the bottle of water, and he, it's gone into the bottle of water, and it's now mixed in with the water, and now we have holy water. Well, believe that if this were the way, Rasulullah would have been the first to tell us to do this. They could have done it. They had jugs, they had containers. He could have blown into containers and tell people, go drink from it. He didn't do it. Sahaba didn't do it. So believe that regardless of who is doing it, it is not legitimate. And oil. And other things. Incenses. And people have all kinds of stuff. A whole paraphernalia. You know, you go into some places, they got a whole, like a drugstore. You know, you can pick from here, there. Oh, you need this one, a little bit of that, and mix it and... And you go to see the witches and the warlocks, they're doing the same thing. You know? So, know that the only way to deal with this world is by way of the Quran and the Sunnah. And this is what the Islamic Online University has been set up to provide. Access to people anywhere, at any time. As long as you have internet connection, you can go and learn the deen correctly. That knowledge is there, and much, much more. I hope, inshallah, that you would take that opportunity to gain that knowledge, benefit yourselves, benefit your community, and get yourselves on the Sirat al Mustaqim. life. I hope we'll meet there. Ciao.